Hello, I'm Brian Atkinson and welcome to UK Aircraft Explored. In this video, we shall cover the Spitfire Mark V's electrical installations and their general function. As we work our way through the various items of equipment, I shall give you extracts from the 1942 Air Ministry Manual, along with wartime electrical circuit AP diagrams that I've reworked into colour. I hope you find this interesting. We shall go in turn through the Spitfire Mark V's electrical equipment, starting with the generator. Electrical power is supplied from a 750 watt shunt wound engine driven generator type LX, which is mounted on the port side of the Merlin engine. Here is a view of the generator's air cooling intake, located on the port cowling panel. During flight, the generator charges the 12 volt 40 amp hour accumulator type D, which is mounted on the starboard side at the rear of the pilot's seat. Power passes through a suppressor type W, which prevents interference with the aircraft's radio equipment. A carbon pile voltage regulator, mounted behind the pilot's headrest, is included in the circuit to maintain a constant voltage, irrespective of engine speeds and load fluctuations. A voltmeter is mounted on the instrument panel in the top starboard corner and is connected across the accumulator. The electrical system comprises of 17 fused circuits allocated in the following manner. 10 fuses for electrical services, 4 fuses for the radio, 2 for the undercarriage indicators, and one for engine starting. These fuses are contained in two eight-way fuse boxes and one four-way as shown here. The generator control along with either the TR9D or the TR1133 or 1143 radio fuses being in single unit fuse boxes mounted on the port side of the cockpit. One eight-way fuse box together with the four-way box, is mounted on the port side of the cockpit below the door. The other eight-way fuse box is mounted above the bottom longer on on the port side of the cockpit. Connection to the main planes is made through ten-way plugs and sockets mounted in the wing routes. Marked three on these AP diagrams, here's the port wing route, And here is the starboard wing route. A three pin socket is mounted on the port side of the fuselage after frame 11 under the fillet for testing the electrical services or radio installation. A door cut in the fillet gives access to the socket as you can see here. In Spitfires not fitted with a fuel pressure gauge, a fuel pressure warning lamp is fitted in its place on the pilot's instrument panel to attract his attention should the fuel pressure fall below a safe working value. The lamp is fitted to a diaphragm switch fitted on the engine in the fuel system. The switch controlling the navigation lamps is fitted at the top port corner of the instrument panel. The port and starboard wing tip navigation lamps consist of lamps covered by standard coloured glass domes. The lamps are inserted in holders attached to the face of the spar at the wing tips and the domes are held in position by detachable shields shaped to conform to the contour of the aerofoil and to give the required cut off angle. This last set of navigation lamps belong to the low-flying clipped wing variant EP120. The tail navigation lamp is inserted in a holder inset in the trailing edge of the rudder and is covered by a streamlined screw-on dome. The upward identification lamp is located after the aerial mast and the downward identification lamp 
is located on the centre line of the main plane. Their purpose is to send a Morse code identification signal or steady beam from the aircraft. Here is a view of the upward identification lamp. And here, the internal mounting point. The lower identification lamp, in this case, has an orange lens. And here is a view of the internal mounting point for the lamp, made visible by the removing of the pilot's seat. The upward and downward identification lamps are controlled from a signalling switch box on the starboard side of the cockpit. This switch box has a switch for each lamp and a morsing key and provides for steady illumination or more signalling from each lamp or both. The switch lever has three positions Morse, Off and Steady. The spring pressure on the morsing key can be adjusted by turning the small ring at the top left hand corner of the switch box. The adjustment being maintained by a latch engaging one of a number of notches in the ring. The range of movement of the key can be adjusted to suit the pilot by opening the cover and adjusting the screw and lock nut at the centre of the cover. Two instrument lamps are fitted on the port and starboard of the cockpit combing. The starboard lamp is mounted so that it can be moved vertically up or down, and the port lamp is mounted on a universal joint so that it can be extended and turned to suit the instrument panel when the TR1133 remote controller is fitted. Both lamps are shielded with an orange cover to prevent glare and are operated by two dimmer switches type A mounted in the centre of the instrument panel as shown here. The reflector gun sight is mounted on a bracket above the instrument panel. The main switch and dimmer switch are fitted below the mounting bracket. The dimmer switch has three positions off, night and day. Three spare lamps for the site are stowed in holders on the starboard side of the cockpit. The fuel contents gauge on the starboard side of the instrument panel indicates the contents of the bottom fuel tank. The gauge indicates only when the push button in board of it is pressed. A double scale is provided on the gauge to give the correct reading for both tail on the ground and flight attitudes. The electrically operated visual undercarriage indicator is fitted on the port side of the instrument panel and has two semi-transparent windows on which the words up on a red background and down on a green background are engraved. These words are illuminated according to the position of the undercarriage units, up when both units are fully retracted and locked and down when both units are fully lowered and locked. The switch for the down circuit of the indicator is mounted on the inboard side of the throttle quadrant and is moved to the on position by means of a striker on the throttle lever and should be returned to the off position by hand when the aircraft is left standing for any length of time. The up circuit is not controlled by this switch. The lamps behind the windows of the undercarriage indicator are duplicated and wired in parallel. The undercarriage warning horn for audible warning is mounted behind the pilot close to his head and sounds when the throttle is less than one third open if the wheels are not locked down. The push switch controlling the horn is mounted on the throttle quadrant and is operated by a striker on the throttle lever. When it is desired to stop the horn from sounding, even though the wheels are retracted and the engine is throttled back, the pilot may do so by depressing the push button on the side of the throttle switch. As soon as the throttle is again advanced beyond about one quarter of its travel, the push button is automatically released and the horn will sound again on the return. On later Spitfires, the push button used for silencing the horn 
is not installed. Moving on, the G42B or the later G45 camera gun is mounted on a bracket attached to a rib on the port wing. Exposures being made through a hole in the leading edge fillet. We shall be covering the G45 camera gun installation and operation in another video. However, from an electrical point of view, the multi-core cable is enclosed in a tubular conduit which extends forward and above the main spar to the back of the camera. When the camera is removed, the socket end of the cable should be placed in the stowage bracket. A combined footage indicator and aperture control is mounted on a wedge plate in the cockpit above the throttle quadrant and is connected to the electrical circuit by means of the adjacent socket. The master switch is situated on the side of the fuselage forward of the fuse panel. A push button for operating the camera independently is fitted to the control column. The heating element for the airspeed indicator pressure head is controlled from the switch below the trimming tab handwheels. To prevent the undue discharge of the accumulator, the element should be switched off on landing. An oil dilution valve to assist starting in cold weather is fitted to the engine on the port side and is controlled by a push switch with a guard attached to the port side of the cockpit. The socket for the pilot's heated gloves and boot supply is fitted in the starboard side of the cockpit at the top of frame 10 in such a manner that the connection will automatically break if the pilot omits to disconnect when leaving the aircraft. The space between the oxygen pipe and the aft side of frame 10 forms a stowage for the socket when the latter is not in use. The engine starter motor is fitted to the starboard side of the engine and a boost coil is mounted on the starboard side of the fireproof bulkhead. These are controlled by two push switches mounted in the centre of the instrument panel, connection to the starter motor being made through a magnetic relay. The main magneto switches are mounted on the bottom left of the instrument panel. Electrical current is supplied to the starter motor from the accumulator, or alternatively by an external accumulator known as a trolleyac, which can be connected through a socket mounted on the starboard engine bearer, as shown here. A power failure warning lamp is fitted on the port side of the cockpit and consists of a lamp and a rectifier unit. The lamp will light if either the accumulator cutout or generator fuse are open circuited. Radio equipment provided for the Spitfire Mark V consists of the following installations. ARI 5000 with either TR1133 or 1143 with beam approach if it was required or ARI 5000 with the TR9D which is fitted only as part of the tropical conversion set. In this video we shall cover just the ARI 5000 with the TR1143. With regard to the ARI 5000, ARI stands for Aircraft Radio Installation, and ARI 5000 was the installation number for IFF Mark II, known as Identification Friend or Foe. Basically, IFF was a transponder used to create an enlarged blip on the UK chain home radar screen and thus confirmed to the radar operator that the Spitfire's radar blip was friendly and not an enemy aircraft. The R3002 is a 12 volt IFF receiver and is mounted forward of the radio door on the starboard side and is controlled through a control panel mounted adjacent to the receiver by an on off switch mounted on a panel on the starboard side of the cockpit. Mounted on the panel are two push switches which are covered by a spring-loaded lid marked Danger. 
These two push switches, connected in series, must be depressed by the pilot together and are in parallel with an impact switch mounted on the port side opposite the receiver. Either the push switches or impact switch operate the detonator on the side of the receiver through a two-pin socket. Aerials run from the outer leading edges of the tailplanes and enter the fuselage just after the radio door through insulator eyelet points being fixed inside the fuselage by means of two shock absorber cords. Connection to the receiver is made by means of a two single pole sockets. Feed to the control unit is made through a three pin plug and socket. And now for a look at the TR1143 system. Wireless stowage access is gained through a door fitted on the port side of the fuselage. Here is a view of the wireless stowage tray. The TR1143 transmitter receiver is mounted on a tray which is similar to and interchangeable with that of the TR9D unit. The unit is attached to four shock absorbers by means of the bolts and check washers which are used to secure it to the transit case. A push button electrical control unit is mounted on a base plate which is interchangeable with the plate for the mechanical remote control of the TR9D. The aerial mast is fitted at its base with a screen socket which accommodates the aerial plug from the TR1143. The mic tail socket and the remote contactor gear are the same as those employed with the TR9D. The junction box, which is a separate unit, is attached to brackets on the port side below the transmitter receiver. A special shorted socket is provided in place of beam approach if it wasn't fitted. The electrical harness consists of metal braided connectors which are secured in roller type spring clips that are provided to enable the various flexible conduits to be secured quickly in position. These clips are marked with red lines. The motor generator is mounted below the transmitter receiver mounting on two rails fitted with shock absorbers. Finally, here are details and positions of the various items of beam approach equipment which could be used with either the TR1133 or 1143. The amplifier is mounted within the roof of the fuselage after the radio bay on a mounting that contains stowage for the connectors. The aerial is mounted on the underside of the aeroplane directly under the TR1133 or 1143 radio and is connected to the amplifier by a screen socket which is incorporated in the aerial mounting. The switch unit controlling the amplifier is mounted on a bracket near the remote contactor which is on the starboard side of the cockpit. Before I finish this video, here is the AP circuit diagrams for both the TR1133 system and here is the TR9D system. Well that's it for this video. I do hope you found it interesting. Please click the free subscribe button below and also like to get notifications when future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.